All right, the book of John. Um, I'm probably not going to have a chance to get through every single verse of this book because there's so many core doctrine just found in the first chapter of the book of John. It's an amazing book, but this chapter especially is just, is just packed hardcore. So I'm going to get into this real quick. Um, we're, we're probably going to go a little bit longer tonight than maybe than normal, but I'm going to try to, to, to cram everything in as best I could. Let's look at that first verse there because even starting with verse number one is such a great, meaningful truth. John 1, 1, the very first verse, the verse that you ought to have memorized, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And right away we see, and we're going to see later that, um, and look down, jump down to verse 14 because it says the Word. Well, what's the Word? What, do, what does it mean, the Word? Look down at verse 14. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we say, oh, okay. Well, here it's saying that the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then later it says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word, obviously, is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God, became, that word manifest, it means like he was made known. God was made known unto us in the flesh. God took on the form of a human being. God, the same God created the heavens and the earth, the Lord, the Lord of the Old Testament, right? The Bible, um, God who spake unto Moses in the burning bush, the same God that did all of these things, that God also became flesh. And, and dwelt among us. And this is, this is where we see in John chapter 1 the deity of Jesus Christ. We see here very clearly, very plainly, that Jesus Christ was the embodiment of God. God in the flesh. God come down to be, to be born among us and to live among us as a man. Now, there's a lot of religions out there. There's a lot of people who teach that Jesus Christ was not God. And, um, and, and, you know, just real quick on John 1.1, 1, 1, you know, it might be sometimes kind of difficult for us to understand as human beings some of these truths. And, and it's such a profound verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So a lot of people say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Because you think of the Word was with God, that means, okay, there's the Word and there's God. So if He was with God, how can they be God at the same time. How could the Word be God at the same time? And um, it's a good question. You know, it's, it's hard to really wrap our minds around this. The way that I, and, and basically it's going to come down to the Trinity. We'll get there in just a little bit. But there's the, the Bible says that there's a Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And one of the ways that I, that I like to explain, there's two ways that I use now, because I, I heard one later that makes a lot of sense too. One of the ways that I use to explain this truth is I think of water right? Water exists in three states. You have obviously liquid water, you have gas when you heat it up and boil it, it's still water, and then you have ice, right? You freeze it, it becomes water. Those are three different manifestations of H2O. It's still comprised of two hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecule, right? I mean, the, the, the basis, what it really is, what it boils down to, what it is, it's, it's still water. It's in essence the same exact thing, yet you see, you know, it appears to you in three different forms. You have a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Um, that's kind of one way of thinking about God, how there could be one God, yet there's God the Father, there's God the Son, and God the Spirit. Right? Another way that I think about is, um, you know, you are comprised of your body, your soul, and your spirit. Every, you know, your body is you. Right? This, is, this is me. This is part of me. This is who I am. Right, But I also have a soul and I also have a spirit. I mean, those are all David versions. Those are all who I am. They all consist of me. And um, it's, you know, again, it's a similar way with God. God has these three different aspects. It's all God. It's all, there's one God, yet he manifest, he's manifested in three different ways. And um, they're fully unique and individual in a sense, but they're also fully God as one in a sense. And, and, and it's, um, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. I get it, but 
the bottom line is this. And see, people have problems with this and say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. But, you know, do you believe that this is God's word? Did this come from God or not? Did he tell us? If, if it doesn't, then why would I believe any of it, right? If this didn't come from God, I don't believe it all. I believe, though, that we have God's word for us today, that he hasn't changed it, he hasn't altered it, that it, that it hasn't been corrupted. Now, there's lots of other corruptions out there. But God has preserved his word for us today. And even if I can't fully grasp something, I'm still going to believe it to be true because it's in his word. Because it says it, I believe it. Now, um, you know, you can't really separate Jesus Christ from the word of God. Now, that word, you know, in, in verse 1, it says the beginning was the word. That word, word, it's not just some meaningless name or title. Right? It's not just like, oh, that's his title, it's word. It's not word. You know, like, <laughs> that's not, that's not, you know, it has meaning. And all throughout the Bible, you see that, you know, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Now, we have, I have in my hands the Word of God. This is the printed Word of God, right? This is the physical, like, just in a, in a way, His words are printed on this page. But, like, it's not exclusive to this printing of this book. The words themselves are the words of God. We just happen to be representing it on a piece of paper and a book and a binding and stuff like that. But these words... These words have existed through all time, just as Jesus Christ has. Jesus Christ was in the beginning was the Word. Now, you think about how much do you need Jesus Christ to be saved? You need Him completely, right? You cannot be saved without Jesus Christ. You have to put your faith on Jesus Christ to be saved. Well, the same way that you need Jesus Christ to be saved, just as much as you need Jesus Christ to save you, just as much as He's a part of that equation, you need the Word of God to save you. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot put your faith in Jesus Christ without the Word, without hearing the Word. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the Word. You see how it's, it, they're inseparable. You need to have God's Word just as much as you need the man, Jesus Christ, to save you. He is the embodiment. These words that are written on this page is, was Jesus Christ was embodying what's in this book. It's pretty amazing. But that's why it says he was the word. Now, there's false versions of the Bible, false religions like Mormonism and, and the Jehovah's false witnesses that don't believe in the deity of Christ. And even in the New World Order Bible version, the New World, or the New World Translation, they call it, it's not even a translation. It's just a corrupting of God's word and just changing it to, to fit whatever their, their views are. And they, they come up with a doctrine and then they say, oh, well, we need a book to fit our doctrine. So they just created their own translation. It was accepted by nobody but their cult, the Jehovah's False Witnesses. In John 1.1, 1, 1, what they do with this verse, because it's very clearly teaching that Jesus Christ is God. You can't get around. It says the Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus Christ was made God. The Word was made manifest. Jesus Christ. They were witnesses of these. All, you know, Jesus' disciples, the people who penned down the Bible, they were witnesses of the Word made flesh. They can't deny that. That's what they're, that's what they're talking about. That's why they're, they're even writing these books. Is they're bearing witness of the Word of God, of the Word made flesh, that He was God in this verse. So what they do with this verse, because it's just too damning for their cult belief, they change it, they add a word. In their, in their false version, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. It wasn't God. He was just a God. And then right there, now you're just introducing, well, how many gods do you believe in? The Bible says there's one Lord and there's one God. And right there in their own false version of the Bible, they're saying, well, Jesus was a God. The Word was a God. And it's always a lowercase G. That's not like God the Father and all this other nonsense. And... Um, it's interesting too because I was just this was just brought to my attention while we're on the JFWs that they're handing out this literature now promoting a world government. One world government. Well, who do we know from the Bible that's going to be leading up a one world government? Of course, we know that the Antichrist is going to come. There's going to be one currency, there's going to be one government, there's going to be one religion. And if you don't take the mark of the beast, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to be killed. You're going to be executed. And if you do take the mark of the beast, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to go to hell forever when you die. Because that's what the Bible says in Revelation 14. Now, um, this, this is kind of shy. I mean, they're, they're not hiding it at all who they serve and who they're looking for. 
Obviously, they're looking for Satan to come and rule and reign on this earth. They think it's going to be Jesus Christ. And of course, you know, the devil, the, the Antichrist that comes to deceive him, he's going to be coming and standing in the temple proclaiming himself basically to be God. He's going to claim to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's how he's going to deceive people. And you know what? That's exactly who the Jehovah's false witnesses are looking for when they're looking for a world government. Why do we need one? Is it possible? Who is qualified to rule? They're looking for someone to rule their world government. And it's not Jesus Christ. They're looking for the Antichrist because that's who they worship and that's who they serve in their, in their twisting of Scripture and in their lies. But this was kind of interesting. They're just coming right out and saying it now. And it's funny, it's funny, because you could spot these Jehovah's False Witnesses tracks a mile away. I mean, it's before, I didn't even see, I barely even saw like one word on this thing. I was like, oh yeah, that's a Jehovah's Witness. But you know, it's, that's their material. It's exactly what they look like. It's a type of paper and everything. You can spot these things a mile away. They're garbage. But it's just, that's really interesting to see that they're just, they're just ready to bring in Christ's, or not Christ, the Antichrist reign on this earth. They're looking for that one world government. Um, but anyways, back to John 1 here. We see that the Word was made flesh. He's obviously talking about Jesus Christ. Um, in 1 John chapter 1, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to get into the, the Trinity here real quick and, and then move on. In John, in 1 John chapter 1, in verse number 1, the Bible says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly... Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So John is opening up his first, his first epistle there in, in 1 John chapter 1. The same way the gospel according to John, he's starting off here. He's basically saying that we're witnesses of this. We have seen this. We have been with Him. He says in, um, in verse 1, he says, That which was from the beginning. Talking about Jesus Christ, which was from the beginning. He's not some created being. He's not like man. You know, God created man on the sixth day. The beginning was before the sixth day of creation. Jesus is from the beginning. He's from everlasting. He has no father. He has no mother. He is without, you know, um, without beginning of days or end of life. Jesus Christ, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. Look, we've heard him. We've seen him with our own eyes. We've looked upon him. Our hands have handled. We physically touched him of the word of life. For the life was manifested. It was manifested in the flesh is what he's saying. It was manifested. We have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Jesus Christ is also the embodiment of that eternal life. When, when you receive Christ as your Savior, the reason why you have eternal life is because Jesus Christ is granting that life unto you through His righteousness and through His works, giving you that eternal life. The eternal life you know, basically resides inside of you. Look at 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse number 6. This is where we come up with our doctrine of the Trinity, the triune God, the three parts, the three aspects of God, but all being one. It says in verse number 6 of 1 John 5, it says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So, Again, we come up with this concept, just like we saw in John 1.1, 1, 1, being was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. You have two, you know, two things there, two beings, sort of, you know, the Word being with them and the Word being at the same time. Well, here we see three, right? There are three that bear record in heaven. One, two, three. So they're distinct. There are three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But then he says, and these three are one. So you have these three aspects that, because, that, that are one, they're manifest as one, but they're three. And again, this is where we come up with these doctrines. So keep these in mind when you're talking to someone who claims to believe the Bible. They claim to be, whether they're Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, or whatever. 
and they don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. You've got John 1.1. 1, 1. You've got uh, 1 John 5 uh, verses 6 through 8 that explain it. And, and, uh, and here's the other thing. This, this is probably the clearest teaching of the, the Trinity, of that doctrine of, of these three being one. It's, it's the absolute most clear. I mean, it just flat out says it. And this is, this is removed from, from the vast majority of the modern versions that are out there today. This one verse. So keep that in mind. Basically, what they do is they combine verses 7 and 8. And it's real tricky because uh, you'll start reading it. And it starts reading like it's um, verse 7. For there are three that bear record. And then I, and I don't remember exactly. I don't remember, I don't remember memorized by any means. But it's like there are three that bear record. And then it just says like the, the spirit and the water and the blood or something. And, and these three agree in one. And it just combines verses 7 and 8 and merges them into one verse without saying that, that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. They remove that Trinity doctrine. Now, it's not only found in this verse. There's, there's plenty of places in the Bible where you can see that, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all God and they're, they're um, but they're one and they're separate at the same time. You know, I mean, there's, there's three that are one. You can get this from other places, but this is the absolute most clear place where it just flat out says it and spells it out without a doubt. And that has been tampered with and changed in these newer versions, perversions of the Bible. Now, um, if, you're, if you're talking to someone and you're keeping notes, it's a good thing to keep notes on because the deity of Jesus Christ is a very important doctrine to understand that, that Jesus Christ is God, that, that he's not just some man, he's not just some teacher. Like the Muslims will say, oh yeah, he was just another prophet, he was a teacher, but he was not God in the flesh. It's not true. We have John 1.1, 1, 1, we have 1 John chapter 5, and we also have Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom and the reason why that's important hebrews 1 verse 8 because it's the verse that says and getting it in context you could read a little bit more of that to someone when you're talking to him but you say unto the son he saith so the one who's doing the talking here is god that's in the context god is doing the talking and he's speaking to the son so he says unto the son he meaning god saith Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So here we see God himself speaking, talking to Jesus Christ, and calling Jesus Christ, the Son, God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Another great verse to prove the deity, the, the godliness, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And you also have 1 Timothy 3.16, which I already read earlier. Without controversy, grace and mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. And, you know, I mean, these verses all prove that God was manifest, that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of God. Which, I mean, you could also look at Jesus Christ wasn't a sinner. He knew no sin. Because he wasn't a sinner, I mean, God is perfect. God is without sin. Hey, Jesus Christ is perfect. Jesus Christ without sin is because he was God in the flesh. Man cannot attain unto that. We are all sinners by nature. We have a nature sinful, we have a, a sinful nature that we're born into. And the Bible says if we say that we have not sinned, we, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us in 1 John chapter 1. So we know that we're sinners. Jesus Christ had no sin because he was God in the flesh. Now, let's continue reading here. I only got into the first verse, basically, of John 1. So let's, let's, let's try to move a little bit quicker through. Look at verse number 2. <laughs> the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And again, I mean, the deity of Christ is so clearly laid out here in John chapter 1. You can't get away from it. Keep your finger in John 1. Turn to Genesis 1, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Because there is a lot of similarities, if you haven't noticed already in the reading, between Genesis 1 and John 1. They both start off with, in the beginning. Right? Just ver John 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning. They're both going back to the beginning, talking about the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And then in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. Right? So again, we're, we're, we're getting this correlation here. And look at, in Genesis 1, 1, it says, 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, what does it say in John 1, 3? All things were made by him. That him is talking about the word. It's talking about Jesus. So again, either there's a contradiction in the Bible or Jesus Christ is God and that it's, it's, it's completely works out just fine because if God is creating everything and Jesus Christ is creating anything, they're both God. It's right to say God created or Jesus Christ created. Um, look at Genesis 1 verse 3. It says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now flip back, if you would, to John chapter 1, verse number 4. The Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now what we see here is Jesus Christ is that light. Look, jump down to verse number 8. It says, He was not that light. Talking about John the Baptist. It says, But was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, his own received him not. So in Genesis chapter 1, we see God creating light and dividing the light from the darkness. And then we see in John chapter 1, Jesus Christ is the light that is now coming into a dark world. The world is full of darkness. Jesus Christ comes in. Hey, he's the light that lighteth every man. He's the light in the world. And you notice in Genesis 1, it says God divided the light from the darkness. And that's what happens. When the light, when there's all darkness, everything is just dark. When the light comes in, it divides light from darkness. It divides in one sense, you know, good from evil. Jesus Christ comes in. Jesus Christ did not come in to unify the whole world into one belief. Now, yes, it would be great if everyone believed on him, but when the light comes into a dark place, you know where you're going to have division. Jesus Christ came in and he divided this world. The people who love darkness and, and love their sins and love, and love wickedness, they don't like Jesus Christ. They will have nothing to do with them because he's the light and that light shines and it's going to expose their wickedness and expose their sins. And hey, that's what the truth does. It uncovers and exposes things. The light shines in places that especially if they've been dark for a long time, you don't want to see what's in there oftentimes. But the light's going to come and shine that brightness on there and expose what's underneath and say, look, this needs to be cleaned up. This needs to be taken care of. And that's what Jesus came in. He was that light. Now, he was in the world. The Bible says, and the world was made by him. Think about this. Think about how amazing it is. The creator of this world, he made everything. The, the, everything that we have, these trees, the animals, everything that exists today, Jesus Christ created. He comes down and visits his own creation in the flesh as a man, just just as basically as one of us and he was rejected. Can you imagine him thinking like, I created this. I created you. I created everything that you have. We don't have anything to do with you. We love this darkness. We get your light out of here. We don't have anything to do with that. And that's how they treated him. And um, it says he even came unto his own, you know, the people of the Jews, his own people, God's own people, and they rejected him. They received him not. They will not have anything to do with him. It's sad. But, um, but thankfully, not everybody rejected him. I mean, by and large, you know, the world rejected him. It's a dark world. But the Bible says in John 1, verse 12, look at verse number 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, there's a false teaching out there, and a lot of people who want to believe that, you know, everybody in this world is a son of God. They'll say, oh, well, we're all children of God. And you probably see bumper stickers. You hear people talking about that. Well, we're all, we're all God's children. No, we're not. You know, I think of that's real common when they did the we are the world thing with all the perverts and sodomites in the, in the music industry with Michael Jackson and all those guys. And, um, you know, there's, there's this whole hands across America thing just saying, oh, well, we're all God's children. That's not true. The Bible says right here, if we we're all God's children, then how could some people have the power to become the sons of God? to become one of God's children. Obviously, it's because we're not. Now, other people will take that and they'll say, oh, well, yeah, it's because we're all children of the devil until you're saved. And I don't believe that to be true either. I believe that, that not everybody that's unsaved is just automatically a child of the devil. 
I believe a person who's a child of the devil is someone who's reprobate. The same way that if you think about when you are born again, when you're saved, when you become a son of, a son of God by receiving Christ, by believing on his name, that's when you become a son of God. You have eternal life. You are saved forever. You are born into that family the same way my children, when they're born into my family, hey, you can't change who your father is. I'm their dad no matter what, you know, physically speaking, they don't have another father. They can never have another father. It's completely impossible. When you're born into God's family, when you receive Christ as your savior, you are born into his family. He becomes your father. It's impossible for you to have another father. He is your spiritual father. And that's the end of the matter. But I believe it's the same way when, you, when the devil becomes your father. When you reject Christ, when you reject God, you have nothing to do with them. And then you just you get reprobate and completely rejected. The devil becomes your father. And I believe, hey, when the devil's your father, there's nothing you can do about that. He's your dad. And that's why I believe the Bible is using illustrations like being born again and using things that we, fit, that we see and deal with on a daily basis that's part of our lives to help us understand these concepts and these truths. And I love, this is one of the, that's one of the best examples you could use out soul winning is this example of being born again. And I, and I have a tendency to use this as much as possible, especially when I, when I talk to people who have children of their own. It's easy concept to understand because you think about it, you know, if you have children, you understand how much you love those children. You understand that, yeah, well, when they break the rules, they got to be punished. But, you know, I mean, I'm not going to kick them out of the family. I still love them. You know, no matter what they do, even if they were to, even if they were to mouth off to me and be rebellious and just, and just do whatever they want to do, they're still my children. I'm still going to love them. I mean... That's something that they're in your family forever and you'll love them forever. And that's something that we could understand as parents. And I like to use that example because, well, why would it be any different with God? When you're born in, you have one birthday. I mean, my children, they all have their own individual birthdays. When you're born into God's family, hey, you have a birthday. And that happens the moment you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and call on his name to save you. That's when you're born into his family. That's your spiritual birthday. Hey, you're born. From that day forward, God is your father. And God is always your father, the same way that I'm always my children's father. It's something that can never be changed. And that's a great example to use out soul winning because people get that. You, you, you could grasp that. And that's part of, the, part of the problem with just preaching the gospel in general is just getting people to understand what it is and what God means, the freeness of it. That look, through no effort of your own, do you become someone's child? My children didn't do any effort to, to become our children. Now, my wife labored, right? And other people might labor in getting you saved, but you don't do any labor in the, in the salvation. You're just born. You're just born again. You just have that spirit born the moment you accept Christ and just believe Him. That's not a work, my friends, believing. That is something that you just, that, that you do, that's the act of receiving that free gift. That's you coming out of the womb, so to speak. But um, let's keep going here. John, we're in, uh, keep going in verse 13. It says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We already read that. Look at verse number 15. It says, John bear witness of him and cried, cried. Now, when the Bible says cried, I, I, I'm pretty sure in every reference, um, I, don't, I don't, can't say 100% for sure, but uh, when it says cried, it doesn't mean like weeping. The Bible uses weeping when you think of like tears crying. When it says cried, it means someone raising up their voice and yelling or shouting, crying out. So just keep that in mind when you read. You know, it says here, John bear witness of him and cried. So he's speaking really loud, he's shouting, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John knew exactly who he was. He knew he was witnessing of and preaching of. He knows that, the, that Christ was God in the flesh because he said he, that's how he knew that he even existed before himself. Now, physically speaking, John the Baptist was born as Jesus' cousin. And he was born physically into this world before Jesus was. If you remember when, um, when Elizabeth was with child with John the Baptist in her womb and Mary had Jesus in her womb, 
She said, the babe leaped in my womb for joy when, when Mary came to visit her. And, um, but John the Baptist is at least a few months older than Jesus Christ. So physically in this world, now when he sees Jesus Christ, he knows it's his cousin. He obviously knows it's his cousin. But he says, um, who he cried out saying that he that cometh after me, because he's, Jesus Christ hadn't started his ministry yet at this point. John the Baptist is out preaching in the wilderness. He's preaching. He's preaching people to repent. He's preaching about Jesus Christ. He's preaching about the coming. He's baptizing people with water. But he says, He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He knew that Jesus Christ existed before him. Now, at, you know, when he was preaching this stuff, he didn't know right away that Jesus was the Christ. But we're going to see how he knew and, and, and what it was that was fulfilled to let him know that Jesus was the Christ. In verse number 16, it says, um, And of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. Verse number 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the, the prophet Isaiah. Now, um, verse, I'm jumping down to verse 27 here because I want to keep this in line with what I was just preaching. Um, in verse 26 says, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. Um, verse 30 says, This is he of whom I said after... Me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Again, he keeps repeating himself over and over again and pointing to Jesus and saying, look, he was before me. You know, this is the Christ. This is God in the flesh. Follow him. It says in verse 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record. So this is where he's, he's going to let us know how does he know that that was Christ? Like, how did he know? He's out preaching, and of all these people, because he didn't know in advance who it was until he saw this. It says in John Bear Record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. So he said, when I saw Jesus Christ, when I saw Jesus, I saw the Spirit. And it wasn't a dove. It just says the Spirit descended from heaven like a dove. I mean, think about how a dove would kind of fly through the air or float down. That's how the Spirit descended upon Jesus Christ. And he says um, in verse 33, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. See, John was commanded to go and baptize with water. He didn't just come up with this on his own. He didn't just say, oh, I'm going to start dunking people underwater and start, you know, preaching you know, the baptism of repentance. He didn't know that. He was commanded to go out and preach this. He says, He that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So he's saying, this is how I know. This is what was told unto me. This is why I'm out baptizing. And this is why I see it. When, I, when he saw Jesus Christ, he saw the Spirit come down and descend and remain upon him. That's how he knew. He's like, hey, that's the Son of God. That's God in the flesh right there. He was before me. And he knows that. I mean, he knows that even though it's his own cousin and he knows that he's physically older, he's like, I know that this is the Son of God. Because that's what was told to me, and that's what he's going around preaching. That's what he believes. We're going to jump back a little bit here. Look, at, um, look, at, look back to verse number 21. Because they're trying to figure out, the Pharisees are trying to figure out, well, who is this guy? You know, like, who are you? You know, like, what, what are you doing out here in the wilderness, and, 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 and who are you to be preaching all this stuff? It says in verse 21, and they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? He answered, no. Now, Elias in the New Testament, whenever you see Elias, it's the same, they're talking about Elijah, okay? In the, it's just the, the translation of the name into Greek from Hebrew, Elijah, Elias, and you'll see Elisha is Elysius, 
in the New Testament. It's the same person, just it's just a different form of the name. Just like in, in Spanish, my name is David instead of David. Um, that's not very much of a change, but you could, there's, other, there's other names. You know, John is Juan. It's not quite exactly the same, but it's, a, it's the same name, but, but it's slightly variation just in that language. Um, El Elias is Elijah. So no, just so you understand that. Now, um, I'm going to get into that a little bit too, but here we see, you know, who's ever heard this argument before about the King James Bible translators? I've heard this because people say like, the King James Bible said they didn't even claim that it's revealed. How could you sit there and claim that, that the, the King James Bible is the Word of God and it's perfect and it's without error and it's, and it's the preserved Word of God when the translators themselves didn't even claim that? Right? Have you heard that before? Because I've heard it a bunch of times. People will say that when, when you try to defend the King James Bible, say, well, well the trans if you read the translators and you read the foreword, they didn't even claim that this was you know, perfect, that they were just, yeah, and it's like, well, look, first of all, they're a humble men. They weren't, you know, they probably didn't realize how great, you know, they knew they were doing a great work and they tried their best, but it'd be the same way as me saying, you know, I don't know everything about the Bible. Hey, if I were going to do something, I'm going to say, I'm going to try my best and do this and work my hardest at it, but it doesn't mean that I'm just going to believe, yeah, God used me to just perfectly preserve his word. I may not necessarily even know that, that God used him. But it doesn't change the truth. And, and the reason why I'm bringing that up here is because here we see the Pharisees, they were asking John the Baptist to say, are you Elijah? He says, no. He says, I am not. He says, are you that prophet? He says, no, I'm not. Well, look at, turn to Matthew chapter 11 real quick. Because John did not claim to be Elijah preaching. But let's see what Jesus Christ said about him. Matthew chapter 11, look at verse number 12. Matthew 11 verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. This is Jesus speaking. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias. Again, the same, they asked him, are you Elias? This is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now flip over to Matthew 17. Because right there we see Jesus Christ saying that this is Elias. He's talking about John the Baptist saying, this is Elijah. He that can, you know, has ears to hear, let him hear. You can understand this, what I'm saying. Look at uh, Matthew 17, look at verse number 10. It says, and his disciples asked him saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. So Jesus Christ, look, Elias has already come. Because the Pharisees, said they were looking for Elijah to come. They were looking for Elias, and they, that's why they asked John, are you Elijah? And John said, no, I'm not. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 11 that Eli Elijah did already come, and he says here in Matthew 17, 12, um, that Elias has come already, but look at verse 13. It says, then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. There, it clearly flat out spells it out. John the Baptist was that return of Elijah. John didn't claim to be Elijah, but according to Jesus, he was. That's who he was referring to, that that, that was the spirit, basically it's the spirit of Elijah coming back in John the Baptist. And that's who they were waiting for. And it says in, um, turn to Luke if you would, Luke chapter 1. We're going to go Luke 1, and then we're going to go to Malachi 4, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and we're going to see why they, um, why they were looking for Elijah in the first place. You know, why, why were they saying, you know, Elijah has to first come? But we saw here in Matthew that Jesus Christ basically spells out that John the Baptist is the coming of Elijah, that they're waiting for, that they're looking for. John didn't claim to be him, but just because John didn't claim to be Elijah doesn't mean that he wasn't the coming of Elijah, right? The same way... And the point I was making is that just because the translator said, oh, well, you know, we didn't do a perfect job, doesn't mean that they didn't really do a perfect job. Does that make sense? I mean, just because they're saying it doesn't make it, um, doesn't just make that something just to, to, to throw out and say, oh, okay, well, you're right then. I guess because the translator says something is perfect means it's not perfect. 
Well, just because John didn't think that he was Elijah to come back to preach doesn't mean that he wasn't. I mean, at least with his spear. And we're going to see what he means. Like, like it's literally Elijah? No, it's not literally physically Elijah. Like, um, you know, obviously he was born of Elizabeth and everything else. But we're going to see what that means here in Luke chapter 1. Look at verse number 13. This is when, this is when the promise was coming that John was going to be born. Luke 1, 13 says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And see, this is kind of special too when you think about that. He's filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Which, which still makes you think like that spirit that's, that's born inside of Elizabeth being the spirit of Elijah. But let's keep reading here. It says in verse 16, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And this was, see, this was all promised to Zacharias that John was going to be born. They're going to say, you're going to call his name John. They already had him named. Like, your wife is going to conceive. Maybe someone coming to me and saying, you know what? Your wife is going to have a child, and this is the name you're going to call him, and he's going to be a great man of God, and this is what he's going to do. I mean, that'd be pretty, imagine someone coming to you and just saying that. Like, that's, pretty, that's pretty crazy, but it's pretty cool. Um, and this was, Zacharias was ministering in the temple, when, when this happened, he saw this angel, and then, of course, like he's saying, Well, how do I know this is going to happen? And um, that he wasn't able to speak, and you, you know, you know, the story, you can read that. But um, he saw this angel, and, he, and he's telling him, This is what's going to happen. You're going to have a son. His name's John. He's going to, and it says he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. The Holy Ghost is going to be, he's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And he was going to go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. So this was promised unto John's father before, before he was even born. That basically he was going to be that coming in the spirit and power of Elias. And, it, and notice this phrase there. It says, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, if you want to keep your finger there, just remember that phrase. Turn over to Malachi chapter 4. We're going to look at the last verses of the Old Testament. The very last verses, right before we get into the New Testament, this is the last thing that was preached out of the Old Testament, out of the Old Testament prophets. Malachi chapter 4, look at verse number 5. Verses 5 and 6 are the last verses of the Old Testament. Verse number 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is why they're looking for Elijah. Because he promises right here in verse 5, Hey, I'm going to send you Elijah. Now here it's talking about the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is, is going to be a day that happens at the, the second coming of Christ, not at the first coming, but there's a lot, there's, I'm not even going to get into that, with the Old Testament and, and with these prophecies, there's oftentimes mixed prophecies and some are, you know, some are pointing in, in, in the first coming of Christ and some are pointing in the second and they kind of get mixed together within the prophecy. And I believe also that sometimes that there's dual prophecy where it's going to happen in Christ's first coming and in his second coming. Um, that you'll see both. But anyways, look at verse number 6, because this is the point I'm trying to make here. It says, talking about Elijah the prophet, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. It's exactly what we saw in Luke 1.17. Um, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So these prophecies are being fulfilled. And it's obvious, it's apparent. You know, when the angel came and, and spoke to Zechariah, and, and John truly was embodying or, or came in the spirit of Elijah the prophet. And, um, you know, he was preaching out in the wilderness and preaching Jesus Christ. And here was his job. Look at, go back to John now, if you would. John 1. Because then they're asking, you know, saying, okay, he, he said, I'm not Elijah. But they say, well, who are you? Like, what do you have to say for yourself, basically? Who, who are you? And he says in verse 23, he says, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So he basically is quoting scripture to him. This comes from Isaiah 40. And I'll read that for you. don't have to turn there. We're going to say in John 1. He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. 
make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. He's saying, that's who I am. You know, back in the book of Isaiah, that's what, and again, here's another, you know, Greek name, Isaiah, is just Isaiah. Same, same, same prophet. Um, and in Isaiah 40, verse 3, we have this quote. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, this shows us the message that John was preaching when he said that I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. And that's exactly what he was doing. He was out in the wilderness. People came to him out in the wilderness. The Bible says that he lived you know, on locusts and, and honey. And that was his meat. That was his sustenance. And, and that he was kind of a rough guy. You know, he, he had a leather girdle, leather belt. And just, just he was living out in the wilderness. And he was preaching the word of God out in the wilderness. And he was fulfilling what was, what was um, prophesied here in Isaiah 40. The voice of one crieth in the wilderness. And here's what he was crying. It says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So his message was, hey, you need to prepare yourself. You need to be ready because the Lord is coming. G you know, the Christ is coming. It says, make straight the way of the Lord. And that's what his message was. Hey, you, need, you guys need to get yourselves ready because the Lord's coming back. You need to get ready. He's coming. He's coming here. You need to make sure you're ready. Make straight. You know, make that path straight. Prepare the way of the Lord. He was out preparing God's, you know, Jesus' path for him, going out and reaching the hearts and, and making a big stir and having this, this great um, ministry where he's going out and people are talking about him. You know, he's baptizing. What's he doing? He's, you know, because people weren't baptizing before that. This was something new. So he's out there trying to get people's attention and preaching in the wilderness and trying to make straight the way of the Lord. And that's what he's telling other people to do too. So let's jump down here back in John chapter 1. In verse 29, he says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold just means look at him. He said, look, Jesus was coming unto John and he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He knew he was the Christ. He knew he was the Lamb of God. It says that this is he of whom I have said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And, um, you know, John had a great ministry. He had a lot of people coming out to see him and to hear him. He had the Pharisees coming and talking to him, like, what are you doing out here? But his biggest goal was to point people to Christ. And that's what our jobs all should be too. He wasn't trying to get glory for himself. He wasn't doing this to draw attention to himself. He was doing this to draw attention to Jesus Christ. Because when he saw Christ, and he already had disciples, there were a lot of people following John the Baptist. He had disciples of his own. We're going to see that here in just a minute. Look at verse, uh, I'll just show you right now. Look at verse number 36. It says, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. The two disciples means his disciples. They were with John. They were with John the Baptist. They're walking with him, and he's like, Hey, there is the Lamb of God. There is God in the flesh. There is the Son of God. He says, The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, I love that understanding that it just proves that he had this understanding knowing from the Old Testament scriptures, the Passover lamb. That's why he's called the lamb of God, you know, which taketh away the sins of the world. All of those Old Testament sacrifices that, that were supposed to take away their sins, John knew what that was about. He knew that was all foreshadowing of the Christ that was to come to take away the sins of the world once for all for everybody, not something that's going to happen repeatedly. He knew that and his whole job was to point people and say, this is the Lamb of God. This is Him. He's here. He's right here. This is who it is. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus of Nazareth. This is who you need to be following. He didn't care about drawing people unto Himself and everybody you know, making some big church and some great ministry where He's the head. No. He said, no, you need to go and follow that man. Behold the Lamb of God. And He pointed him to Him. That was his job, was to point people to Jesus. That's what he came for. It wasn't to build up anything of his own. And that's what we're supposed to do as Christians and in the church. Hey, we need to be pointing people to Jesus Christ, saying, 
This is where your salvation is going to be. It's not going to come necessarily through our church or through a man. God's going to come through, through Jesus Christ. And we need to point people to Him. And I love the reaction that so many people immediately have when they become aware of Christ. And this we see this all throughout the rest of this book. We're in, um, let's see, we just read verse 37. Look at verse 38. It says, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? What are you looking for? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Now here, you know, real briefly, it's telling us the definition of the word rabbi is master. That's what that means. When, when, you, when you hear someone being called rabbi, it, mean, it literally means master. And the Bible says not to call any man master upon the earth, for one is your master in heaven, even God. And it says not to call any man rabbi. Yet what do we have today? We still have rabbi. We still have people that call themselves Jews, that, that, that practice the false religion of Judaism, that don't believe that Jesus Christ has come back in the flesh. They have an antichrist religion. They're still waiting for the Christ to come. And, and they're going to be fulfilled when the devil comes. When the antichrist really comes, they'll receive him as Christ because they rejected the real Christ. They rejected the real Savior. But they still use these terms, even though it says, you know, the Bible says not to call any man rabbi, not to call anyone master, not to call any man father. Which, again, how about father? That's the Catholic Church. Again, I mean, people like to take, the, they, they don't treat the Bible seriously. It's like, like, how could you even overlook that? It's very clear. It's in black and white saying not to call. But what I'm not going to, let's just keep reading here in John chapter 1. I'm running out of time. Verse 39 says, He saith unto them, Come and see, because they asked him where he lives. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now, of course, this is before he really started. His, he's just starting to get people to follow him. And because you remember later it says, um, The foxes have dens and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Where you're saying, because he becomes homeless, basically. He's just going around because he's walking around and teaching and preaching everybody. He just, he left his house. But here, he at least has a place to stay. So they come and they see where he lives. It says, And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Peter's brother, Andrew, he was a disciple of John first. And John pointed him to Jesus. So then he starts following Jesus. And he find he comes to Christ, basically, right? I mean, this is all a good illustration. Andrew comes to Christ. So what does he do? Look at verse number 41. It says, He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. It's exciting. And you know, that is what we are. When you come to Christ, when you receive that gift of salvation, when you realize, hey, Christ has come in the flesh. He came and He died for me and He paid for all of my sins. The Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the whole world. And you know Him and, and you get saved. You receive Him. Hey, that's a great thing. Why wouldn't you want to go out and hey, first find your own family members. Find your brothers. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Say, look, we found Christ. He's our Savior. He saved me from hell. He saved me from my sins. And uh, want to go out and tell others about it. That's something that ought to be something that burns inside of you. And if it's not, you need to work on it. And, and recognize, maybe think about your own soul first and just think about what He did for you to try to help to get that love to tell other people and want to show other people. But we see this reaction in multiple places throughout this, throughout this passage here, just in John chapter 1. We saw... Um, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother went and did that. And then we see in, um, in verse number 45, or in verse 44, it says, and Phil, Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And, and so he goes, Philip goes and finds Nathaniel, and he's just trying to bring more people to Christ. And this is the type of, of attitude that we need to have as Christians, just like John the Baptist had, just like Andrew had, just like Nathaniel or Philip had. Hey, we found Christ, isn't it? Look, look, we've got it. You know, he's here. He's, gonna, he's here to take away the sins of the whole world. Well, Jesus Christ already came and died and rose again from the dead. We have even more scripture to back up that evidence. More than just him even being here physically, we've got the whole Bible that we can show unto other people. Hey, behold the Lamb of God. Look what he did for you. It's recorded in scripture. 
I'm going to wrap things up now here with this. The Bible says, um, jump down to verse number, or jump up here. I guess I skipped over this to verse number 43. The Bible says, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. So, um, it's a real simple message, and that's how Jesus goes around and, and recruits his disciples. He just says, Follow me. This message still applies today. Jesus Christ still wants people to follow him. Now, he may not be physically walking around this earth, but that's what he wants. And there are so few that are willing to do it. And, and it's, and it's kind of sad because, look, it's one thing for a person to get saved. It's another thing to actually follow Jesus Christ. Now, we know that we don't have to follow Jesus Christ and do everything that he tells us to do to be saved. That would be a works-based salvation. We get saved simply by putting our faith in Christ, but Jesus doesn't want you just to be saved and that's it. He doesn't stop there. That's not where you end. That's the beginning. That's the starting point. He says, look, no, follow me. But it's not going to be easy. And I'll tell you right now, people are going to come and go through this church. You're going to see it happen. Just get used to it. I've gotten used to it in Faithful Word. I mean, in Faithful Word is one of the best churches I've ever seen in my life. Great people, great pastor, people that love God. But you know what? A lot of people getting saved, but not that many that really want to follow Christ. You see people come, and, you, and we've already seen it here. People will come, they'll, they'll get saved. They, they, they put their faith in Christ. Maybe they'll even get baptized. They'll start coming to church. And then one day, you just never see them again. They just, for whatever reason, they stop coming. And there's lots of reasons for that. Usually it's the cares of this world or they can't handle persecution or their family or whatever. There's all kinds of reasons why people get out of church. But we need to understand, I mean, Jesus Christ had 12 people following him. And you can see throughout his ministry, at some points there was a lot of people following him. And then sometimes everybody just turned away and even said to the 12, are you going to go also? Not everybody, you know, people will come for a while. They'll come maybe when there's the free food. They'll come when, when things sound great and, and, and you know there's this compassion and, and he's feeding all this multitude. But then when he starts preaching hard and he starts telling you the way it is, and he starts telling you, hey, you know, the Bible says that you, you, need, to, you need to give up, you need to, you need to quit drinking because it's a sin. You need, you need to get right with God uh, or whatever it is, whatever the sin may be. Hey, look, this is what God says. You ought not to be doing those things. It's wickedness. It's sin. Hey, that's when a lot of people are saying, well, I don't really sign up for this. I don't want to follow that. That's, what, that's just, that's the way it is. That's why there's so many people, I believe, these days that don't actually follow Jesus. Because becoming his disciple and following him, just being willing to do it, say, whatever you say, Jesus, that's what I'm going to do, is different than just putting your faith in him to be saved for your salvation. And um, following Jesus, Jesus is not easy. It requires work on your part. I mean, Jesus Christ walked around. He didn't have a place to stay. He didn't know where he was going to get food from. He didn't, you know, there's all kinds of things that were unknown. Yet, following Jesus is going to require faith. That's why I preach on faith on Sunday. We need to have that faith to just say, well, this is what God's Word says. I may not understand it. I may not know why certain, you know, why I have to do things this way, but, it's, but I can see it. You know, I, I could see that this is what it's telling me to do. Um, you know, for, for me, for example, one of the things that was really hard for me to do, I'll close with this, one of the things that was really hard for me to do was to go out and go soul winning, to go out and knock on doors and actually talk to people. Now, it's not that I didn't want people to get saved. Of course I did. You know, I, I had that, that desire. I wanted people to get saved. But I didn't want to actually go out and talk to them. I didn't, I didn't want to start a, a conversation from nowhere walking up to some person's house that I don't even know. I mean, to me, that was foreign. It, to me, it's like I go to my house because that's my house. Why am I going to go? What, not, you know, I don't need anything. I'm not going to go knock on their door. And I was shy. I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. So there was a lot of reasons why I didn't want to go out and go soul winning and go and just go start up conversations with strange people. I was there's a little bit of fear. What are they going to say to me? 
Are they going to call the cops on me? Are they going to, you know, what are they going to do? How are they going to react? Are they going to yell at me? Whatever, whatever the fears may come up. There's a lot of fears that people have. But that doesn't change what the Bible says, you know, clearly to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. That is a command of God. And, and I saw that. Didn't, that didn't take much convincing to see that truth. That didn't take much study. That, that didn't take like 10 sermons to hear to be like, all right, I guess I'm convinced, you know, you finally proved it out of Scripture to me. No, that's something that's proved very fast, that this is something that we need to be doing. And for one, it just makes sense, but it's very easy to see that from Scripture. The hard part is then is just deciding, and this is where a lot of people fall out. This is where a lot of people will just bail out because it's, because it's going to make you uncomfortable, because it's something that you have to decide to do that you don't really want to do. I didn't really want to go out and talk to people. I didn't want to go out and knock on people's doors. But it was something that the Bible said that I needed to do. So you know what? I'm just going to do it. Because that's what's right. And that's what God is commanding me to do. I may not understand. Well, you know, people say, oh, but if God wants someone to get saved, you know, he'll lead it to you. And then you'll have this perfect conversation. And then that's how people are going to get saved. No. That's not what he said he was going to do. He says, you need to go out. You need to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You need to go out and do these things. Bring his word out and bring the people in. That is our job. And, and because things become difficult, because things aren't easy, because it might make you uncomfortable, that's when people don't want to follow Jesus. So it's too hard. I don't want to do that. I don't want to give up my Sunday mornings to come to church. I don't want to do whatever. What, whatever. I mean, people have all kinds of stupid reasons why they get out of church. I don't like hearing the pastor talk about my TV shows. Whatever. Whatever it is. What, whatever it is that you just don't, you don't, you can't deal with. Or I don't like my family, you know, making fun of me. Because they think, we, oh, you're so strict. Oh, you go to that church. Oh, they're crazy. Oh, whatever. Whatever the reason may be. It's not easy to follow Jesus, and, and there, Jesus didn't have that many followers all the time. Um, but don't let, it get, don't let it get you down when people end up getting out of church. Um, you know, pray for them. Try to communicate with them. Try to get them in. But, but don't let that bring you down and get you discouraged and get you to stop following Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not an easy thing to do, but hey, get your heart right. Get, just build your faith. Know that you're doing the right thing. And even if everyone, you know what? If, if everybody that, ev that comes to our church, now if everybody stopped coming to this church tomorrow or on Sunday, if no one showed up, I would still keep doing what I'm doing. I am not going to change that. People say, oh, you're crazy. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm doing things. I believe that what, that what God has told me to do, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. Whether, whether there are a, a thousand people to come and listen and to hear and, and to get involved and, and to do the work, or whether there's zero people here. I'm still going to do that which is right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the book of John. God, what a great book. I pray that you would please just help us all to learn a lot, all these key doctrines that are important to our faith, dear Lord. I pray that you please just teach us and guide us and um, keep us safe throughout the week, dear Lord, when we go our separate ways this evening. God, I pray, that you, I pray for the people that, that have come through this church, dear Lord. I'm not going to name their names right now, but, but the people who have come through here, Lord, you know who they are. You know who, who has truly put their faith in you, dear Lord. And, and um, I don't know what's going on in all their lives, but I pray that you would please just, just reach them individually and, um, and just give them that message again of follow me and, um, and help us to follow you, dear Lord. Help us never to forsake that command to, to follow you and that you would just strengthen us and build us in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.